to me right where I needed to be. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Hello, friends. I'm Jeff here, and welcome to Squadron, and welcome to Squadron Facebook Live. Today is another day, and time for another story. It's been a while. Uh, it's a dreary day outside. I mean, it's raining, it's windy, so it might be a good uh, time to tell a dreary story or a horror story. It's a story about uh, stupidity, laziness, and um, ignorance, making a bad decision. And you guessed it, it's a story about me. It's also a story about taking safety for granted and the realization when you take um, safety or, or blink an eye at the wrong time in your life, it can end up in disaster. Uh, luckily for me, at the end of the at the end of the of the of the day, it uh, it turned out uh, somewhat okay. It's also a lesson I learned uh, that uh, when a contraption comes with an instruction sheet or a safety measurement uh, yeah. guide, that uh, that you that it's there for a reason. So what is the story all about, and what does it have to do with modeling? Because you know. Uh, the, safety and all that kind of stuff. So what has it do with modeling? And a little bit into the story, you will realize what it all connects to the modeling, uh, to my modeling career, if I can call it like that. It's a story about this guy, my thumb. And the day it got separated from me and I had to pick it up underneath the table in a dark and tank basement in Belgium. So let me, tell you, let me start from the beginning. So a long time ago, uh, about 30 years ago, I worked for, for Linden Productions and for the older generation that is out there, we all know who Verlinden is for the younger generation or for people who don't know who Francois Verlinden is or was. Uh, he was the guy, the godfather, the father, the great father, the grandfather of the resin industry. Uh, he was the one that really put his, uh, like I made a footprint into the accessory business and what the industry become today or became today. is also the one that uh, re revolutionized uh, finishing a model. Uh, he had some groundbreaking uh, techniques back then uh, as far as uh, washing and weathering and uh, dry brushing. So his techniques were really, really world renowned and he really, really set uh, the pace of what it is today. And it's still holding up. His techniques are still holding up today. Now, he was a fellow countryman of mine, uh, also he lived in the same city, and he had a hobby shop. Now, I frequented that hobby shop all the time, and I saw that his, uh, his, uh, his dioramas and all that, and it, it really, me and him, at least I had the same vision than, uh, than, than he had about finishing a model. And I knew if I could get close to him, maybe some of that uh, would rub off. Now, he was very successful in his little model shop, but then also he started to uh, really become more and more professional and uh, his business started to grow. So there was a job opportunity for me to work there. So I was hired the first year as a mold maker, mold maker uh, and a resin pourer. So I pulled resin sets for a, for a year. Then afterwards, I graduated more and more into pattern making. And then eventually I started uh, painting and finishing models and dioramas. So I became part of uh, the Linden Studios. So me and him, we worked on several projects. So I got more and more in, into the, 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 the painting and the finishing. And so I became all around. So the dioramas back then, they were made on hardwood basis, hardwood like you use for flooring, hardwood floor. But back then those came in panels, but like six by four or six by eight big panels of hardwood. And we used to cut them up in, in small sections, like 10 by 10 or 12 by 12. And that's where we made the dioramas on. Now hardwood, for people uh, out there uh, that are worked with hardwood, it's very hard to cut. I mean, it's, the word says itself, hardwood, so it's very hard to cut uh, that kind of material. And you have to have at least a, a serious, powerful table saw. So he acquired uh, some industrial table saw and uh, he cut most of the, uh, the board himself. So one day, uh, one morning, uh, he, comes, he comes over to me and said, well, Jeff, I don't have a lot of time. I'm in a meeting. Can you cut me a couple pieces? Because 
I really need a few. I want to work on some dioramas this afternoon and I really need uh, like two or three pieces. Uh, can you cut those for me? I already marked them with a marker and you just stay on the line and you know where the saw is, uh, such and so. Now, of course, I never uh, operated a table saw. Uh, I saw him do it and I was pretty convinced it was not like rocket science, but I also knew that it scared me a little bit because, uh, again, for the people who worked with a table saw, when you put uh, the table saw on, yeah, it, it, it's quite scary. I mean, it's, it's loud, it's, it's noisy, it's, it's, um, it, it's quite impressive. So I said, no, okay, the man that I was back then, no big deal, uh, I'll do this for you. So I go down the basement and now you have to also understand that back then his, uh, his shop was in an older, like a Victorian style house with old brick and the older houses, they all have basements. So, like in Europe, most of the people have basements. But it was also like dark, uh, only the necessities. There was not really anything uh, attractive about uh, a Belgian basement. So I get down the stairs and uh, in the middle of this area, there was this massive table saw. Uh, and on top of it, there was like a little, uh, like a light bulb, like you see in the, in the horror movies, it was like a little light bulb on a chain. And that was the, the lighting uh, over the table saw. So it looked really medieval. Uh, scary looking but uh, I was on a mission no big deal so okay now I did see that the table saw the blade did not have uh, a, a, a safety not have a safety guard so I said well this is gonna be a little bit more uh, tricky uh, but luckily when I looked to my side on the table there was a safety guard so I took it and I put it in place now mind you that back then those table saws and the safety uh, apparatus was a little bit more primitive than it is now. Now you have these uh, self-adjusting safety guards, so you attach it, you put the board through, and however the thickness of the board, the safety guard will uh, adjust itself. Back then, you had to do it manually, manually with a wing nut. So I took the safety guard, slid it over the, uh, the splitter in the back, and adjusted it with the wing nut just the height of the board. So I was all ready for action. Okay, uh, I flipped the, the switch on and the whole thing came alive. And I'm telling you, if you've been in, uh, next to a table saw in a, in a closed environment where there's not a lot of, it's noisy, it's, it's, it's loud, it's, it's, it was very scary. Also, uh, earphones back then, uh, safety, that was all like, uh, who needs that? So fine. So I put the, the first board in there and I tried to stay on the line, uh, uh, on the marker. So I was almost there at the end. I only had to do like maybe, probably an inch, maybe an inch and a half, and I, it got stuck. Oh, it got stuck. So I looked underneath there and it, I didn't understand why it got stuck because it, it, to me it looked, it was, it was fine. It, I just needed to, just a little bit more. So I thought, well, you know what, if I put some pressure on it, I can, uh, I can, I'm sure it will move and I can finish the last inch. So I put some pressure in it, nothing happened, and I put some more pressure in it, and I put some more pressure in it, and finally, bam, I slipped off, slipped underneath the guard, and I saw something fly by uh, my, my face. Something went to the right. So I, it's somebody, it looked like somebody slapped me like real hard on my hand, and when I looked at it, uh, I immediately, I, I mean, it, it, this all happened in a, in a fraction of a second, you know, it was just absolutely quick and it didn't dawn on me that I, I just had to cut my, I just cut my finger off. So I looked at it and it looked like, I didn't know what to look for. I mean, I saw all the blood in here and then I realized my thumb is missing and I tried to wiggle it just to assure myself that it was missing and I see this little bone sticking out and it went like this. Then I realized, yeah, I'm in trouble here. Now, I did not panic. I did not panic. Uh, there was no pain. Uh, the only thing that I, that I felt was just, like I said, was a hard slap on, on my fingers and that was it. But I realized I saw something pass on the right side uh, of, uh, of my face. So I looked in that direction and luckily, immediately, I saw where it was. It was underneath the table there on the floor. And uh, so I said, well, I need to recover this because uh, now I start thinking like, oh my God, I, I need to get it, uh, the uh, reattachment, uh, blah, blah, blah. So I walk over there and uh, now, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you guys cut something off, 
you know, maybe a limp or a digit or whatever. But if you have to, uh, if you see something laying there that you know that was attached to you and alive and well 30 seconds ago and now it's laying dead on the table, it's a little creepy. I can tell you that right now. So I bent down and I picked it up and, you know, you get the feeling like you're picking up dog poop. You know, everybody, eh? I'm sure you picked up dog poop once in your life. So you know that you put you put the plastic over your hand and then you're gonna go to the dog poop and you know you have to pick it up but you don't want to you don't want to feel it that's how i picked my thumb up like I, I was just picking up like dog poop it might be a strange comparison but that's how it felt so i picked up the, 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 the thumb up put it in my hand closed my fingers put my other hand on there and hurried to the staircase so i run up the staircase and uh, halfway the staircase I remembered that I forgot to turn on the, the table saw. In a normal situation, I should have said, screw it, and I'm just going to be out of here. But again, my mind was working. Again, I was not panicking. So I, I, I said to myself, uh, I need to turn it off because if I don't say anything or I don't turn it off, it will be forgotten and it, it starts. Uh, it's going to run hot and it's going to burn down the building. So downstairs I came right to the table saw and shut it off. I remember I used my foot. I just used my foot to do it off. Then back upstairs. Uh, now, at the top of the, the staircase, there was a door, and the door led into the kitchen, uh, Lillian's kitchen. So I opened the door, and there was Lillian. Lillian was uh, Lillian's wife, and I think she was making a pot of coffee. Now, before I go on with the story, I've always been a, a, a prankster, or at least I, I try to make life a little lighter for everybody. I try to bring some fun or laughter. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I was used to known as a, a, a prankster. So I get in there and she looks at me and I said, well, Lillian, I cut my finger off. And she said, oh yeah, right. So I said, no, I'm serious, I'm serious. So I open my hand and there is my finger in there. So immediately, almost immediately, uh, her eyes, I think, rolled all the way back and she started to get a little bit wobbly and uh, it just went out of my way. Then at that moment, the cleaning lady uh, walks in and uh, she said uh, what's going on here so I said well I cut my finger off I need some help here so she started taking off screaming mm -hmm. two minutes later Verlin comes down what the hell is going on here so I explained that to him what, what just happened now Verlin uh, he didn't panic easily either so he looks at me like yeah, you stupid fool kind of a thing what did you do uh, and but you know me immediately he took control it's like okay uh, call the ambulance uh, give him a towel uh, put him on a chair uh, and he said to me well you know what we're going to put you we're going to put you outside uh, you got to get some fresh air uh, that will do you good because by that time i looked as as white as a bed sheet so they ushered me outside and they put this uh they put the kitchen chair outside <clears throat> now again i told you at the beginning of the story uh, his shop was located in a busy uh shopping street you know it was all shops and people started walking by so here i'm sitting on the curbside on a kitchen chair my pants full of blood my shirt full of blood my arm the towel and i'm sitting there waiting for the ambulance while people walking by so um, i didn't want to make eye contact because nobody wanted to talk to me either because i looked pretty dangerous uh, with all that blood and uh, so i sit there like uh, good morning good morning so finally after five ten minutes the uh, the ambulance pulls up and <clears throat> the ambulance back then it was not like they have over here uh, it was a VW bus like an old <laughs> VW bus with only the drivers like one guy so he gets down over, over the cobblestone street so he stops and uh, he said are you okay I said well uh, it all depends you know I, I just got my finger off and he said uh, <clears throat> you want to lay down or shall I get the stretcher out of shall I get the stretcher out of the out of the out of the back of the of the ambulance or you're gonna sit on the stool there i said well i didn't want the embarrassment of laying down in the middle of the curbside i said i'll i'll crawl in the back so he opens the door so i crawl into the into the back of the ambulance and i sit on the little stool he closes the door walks around it gets in front of the wheel or behind the wheel and takes off so i'm sitting there now back then the streets were all cobblestones it was like a little medieval town i lived in and they they, they just kept the cobblestones like, uh, like like it was like many many years ago so i'm sitting there uh, wobbling and bobbling uh, all over the place all the way to the hospital now at the um, in the ambulance that then it's really it really dawned on me what i did uh, it really finally uh, sunk in 
like I cut my finger off. And I was not so worried about cutting my finger off. I was worried that I would never build a model anymore. Now in hindsight, this sounds a little stupid because you know, uh, uh, I've, I've seen people with one arm or people with, with one hand or, or I mean, you, you can do it wherever there is a, uh, a will there is a way but back then to me it was a disaster it was the end of my career I was done I would never build a model again I would never uh, hold a, a paintbrush etc and that was the only thing that occupied me so finally we get a, uh, we get in the hospital so I get out of the I crawled out of the out of the uh, out of the ambulance and I, I had to go into the waiting room because by the time we got into the hospital it was already around maybe 11 11 uh, and most of the surgery surgeries were in session so I had to wait until the next available doctor in the next available uh, uh, operating room so they, they put me in the waiting room now meanwhile they gave me a little sedative so I didn't still didn't feel any pain I just felt some electric current go through up and down my arm but at least most of the pain was not there so I sit there and after maybe another five minutes a nurse comes out and said, well, we need to take some x-rays, uh, follow me. So, okay, follow, follow the nurse, get into the x-ray room. They put me on, on a little bar stool and I had to put my, my, uh, my hand, I had to wrap the towel, put my hand on the table and take my finger and put it next to my hand. So I had to do it like this and then I had to turn it over and move my thumb to the other side. And then they took a couple of pictures, they said, we're ready, you can go. So put back my thumb back in my hand, clamp my hand. Meanwhile, they gave me a, a clean, kind of a clean cloth to put around it, and they put me back into the waiting room. <clears throat> so I sit there at least another 35, maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Then finally, two nurses come in. One came in with a, I remember that uh, she had like a stainless steel bowl, and there was like a little blue cloth in there, and I had to put my thumb in there. And so, okay, I put my thumb in the, in the, in, in the bowl, and then uh, the other nurse came and got me because uh, yeah, I had to be prepared to go into surgery. So my thumb goes that way and I go that way. And uh, there was a little separation anxiety because I thought maybe I will never see him again and uh, that's it. So, okay, uh, they got me to the, they prepared me for the surgery. <clears throat> they rolled me into the, into the operating room and they put me on the, on the operating table. Now they didn't really put me out, they gave me an uh, anesthesia, but it was just a little bit, so I stayed conscious. I, I, I wasn't knocked out completely. Now what they did, they, I had, they pulled my arm all the way over my shoulder like this, and they put like three or four tourniquets around it, so for the blood, I guess, and it was like this, and that hurt. I mean, not my finger, not my hand, but the tourniquets on my arm hurt. And then they put like a, some sort of a, a curtain, a little curtain over it, so I could see everything else, but I could not see what happened as of my shoulder. And again, I was in and out of consciousness. And then finally, I, I, the doctors came in, and uh, one of the times I woke up, I heard one of the doctors say to the other guy, uh, he made a big mess out of it. <clears throat> I remember that uh, clearly that he said, this is a big mess. And then I went back to sleep and woke back up. And once in a while I could hear drilling and scraping and, and all kind of stuff. So that took probably uh, another, another maybe hour, maybe less than an hour. Uh, when I woke up the last time, the doctors were already gone and they were already pushing me into a recovery room, I guess. So uh, lay there for a couple more hours, then a nurse came by, looked at, uh, looked at my hand because uh, she took the, the bandages off. and. That's the first time I could see me and my friend were reunited. You know, we, uh, I, I still had it back. I couldn't move it anyway. And it looked like uh, Dr. Frankenstein uh, had been at work. So long story short, I was a little bit relieved that that thing was back in place. Uh, I'll build, uh, I, would, I would deal with the, the other stuff later. Now you can see uh, they had to take a, a, a pretty big piece off. You know, you see it's a lot. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a lot, a lot smaller than it used to. Anyway, what they did is since I, I cut into also part of this cushion side of your hand, I guess. Uh, I also cut in there, but I cut into the joint too. So what they did, they had to, to basically uh, bevel the two sides and then put it back together like, like, like this, and then uh, put a screw in there. So that's, that's what it, and then they sewed it up. So I stayed maybe one or two more days in the hospital. 
uh, just to make sure that the tongue was not rejected or anything. And finally, they, uh, they put like a cast around it and they sent me home. They did tell me, they said, well, you're gonna be in that cast for at least four or five weeks and then uh, there's gonna be rehabilitation, there's gonna be therapy for at least six, to, uh, six months to a year before you're gonna uh, basically move your hand again or, or at least do something with your hand. And that freaked me out too because I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna be incapacitated for all that long. So I promised myself, I said, I'm gonna do anything I can just to speed up the process. Uh, it was stupid, you know, but that's what I thought. So long story short, um, uh, after that, uh, the first couple of days, I already started getting feeling back and I, I, and I, I reassured myself, I'm gonna be okay, because I, I felt, yeah, I can do this, I can do this. Next Monday, went back to work. Uh, did some, some little stuff here and there and uh, worked for another four or five weeks and then eventually the big day came, they were gonna take uh, the cast off. So I get there, they take the cast off and maybe you guys out there uh, had ever something breaking in uh, a leg or an arm or a hand. Whenever you're in the cast, it's pretty strong and then you think you're, you're, you're gonna be okay, but then they take the cast out and it, actually you become like this, like limp. Like uh, completely, completely powerless. And I thought I, uh, this was gonna be the rest of my life, that I'm gonna have this little limp hand hanging out, but that only takes like a couple of days and then things uh, became all back to somewhat normal. Now, another thing about therapy, I never went one day. Never went one day to therapy. I just went back to work the next, the next day and uh, gradually I started, uh, and what, what better therapy is there than build a model? So I was really into it, and after two weeks, three weeks, I was back to normal. Now I still find, I mean, I, I don't have any feeling here. Uh, it, it's, it's okay, I mean, sometimes when it's bad weather it hurts a little, but I was pretty lucky because I can do practice most anything. So uh, I, I learned my lesson there, you know. Uh, and the irony, the irony of it all, and this, this is a boggle of my mind, I cut my thumb off, I, I lost my finger because I put the safety on. If I wouldn't have put that safety on and, and just uh, went with the, with the blade, I would not have cut my finger off, or at least uh, I think so, I would not. But because I put the safety on, that's when uh, I got in trouble. The problem was I should have turned off the machine because it said in big letters, whatever you do, whatever malfunction you have or whatever happens to the saw machine, turn the blade off and wait until it stops. And I didn't do that and I paid a price for it. So again, if something comes with an instruction sheet, please read it. Uh, don't be stupid like I was. And uh, that was about it. That was about it for my story. Now, of course, uh, we're uh, we're gonna go um, we're gonna go on with our question. Are you right or left hand? Well, uh, somebody asked me if I right or left hand. I am right handed, so it was my main hand, and uh, that uh, well, that's why I freaked out so much because I, I my good hand was damaged. Do you keep Do you keep uh, your box from your kids? Uh, no. Uh, I, I think you mean like uh, if I if I build a model, do I keep the box? No, I throw it away. Uh, occasionally, if I really really like the picture, but that happens maybe that happened maybe like five times in my life, I kept uh, the box art and then framed it. But uh, ninety nine percent, I throw it away. Uh, okay, all right, I, I put it in the last. Uh, you know, another question. Uh, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. You know, I'm still communicating uh, here. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, hi. Uh, I see you, you're watching. Uh, hi. And we have uh, Dave, uh, William, Mark, Tim, Lonnie, Ty, Ty Gooken. Uh, we still have uh, that tank here for you. Uh, the, I think you still need to call our customer service because we still have that Panther, uh, that uh, Tiger tank here for you that you want. Then we have uh, Mike, uh, Bob, Mark, and Cal. Hey guys, uh, thanks for tuning in. I hope you like the story. Uh, some of you guys will remember my ordeal, but uh, glad you're tuned in. So now we're gonna go on with the next uh, drawing uh, last week. So I'll have Jean-Anne do the honors. Jean-Anne, uh, 
You want to say hi to the people? Uh, hey, this is Jean Ann. Hi, is, everybody. Uh, cameraman today, so she's going to have her uh, innocent hand sticking in there. So see where the lucky, the lucky winner is. And the lucky winner is McCoon Mac. McCoon Mac. I hope I pronounced that right. You're the lucky winner of this uh, Academy, oh, I'm sorry, Dragon uh, Tiger Tank. So please call our customer service, uh, say your name and your address, and we'll get that thing out to you as soon as possible. So again, for the need for the next uh, drawing, please leave a comment hmm, in the comment section. Also, share it with your friends, uh, share it uh, with everybody. Subscribe, subscribe on Facebook, subscribe on uh, YouTube, on Twitter, Instagram, please do that. Also, visit our, uh, our website, that's squadron.com. Now, we have an action, we got, a, we got a, uh, a new container that came in a couple days ago. So uh, we restocked some hobby bus uh, and trumpeter. Now, we have an action going or a sale going over the weekend. It lasts all the way to 12 o'clock on Monday night. And it's uh, anything aviation, uh, either a kit, an accessory or a book, anything that has anything to do with aviation, if you buy that, uh, or you buy several things of that, you get 20% off your entire cart. So on top of everything else, you get 20% off. Okay, we have this uh, action going on until uh, Monday night at 12 o'clock midnight. And uh, for next week's raffle, we are gonna raffle off the Kitty Hawk uh, uh, RF5E Tiger, beautiful kit. So uh, please leave your comments into the comment section and you will be eligible to get into the uh, bullshit bag next week and be part of our weekly raffle. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Uh, it's bad weather here in Texas, so time to build models. And um, other than that, uh, I'll see you guys next week, uh, 12 o'clock Central Time. Uh, but for now, Jeff Fee here, signing off.